Hey, I'm Dr. Rob. Welcome to Biblical Genetics. I'm standing today in front of an outdoor factory where they make large concrete objects. It's a factory that services the southeast of the United States. They make uh, uh, bridge spans, they make parking garages, they make walls out of concrete with the windows and doors already put in place. It's a bustling hive of activity. And I want to use this factory as an analogy to the genome. So I want to ask, how much of this factory is functional? And how would you even answer that question? It's a very similar thing when we ask how much of the genome is functional. How would you even answer it? Well, I guess it depends, doesn't it? So let's think of a way we can assess functionality of this factory. Let's say that they can make a 10 meter by 10 meter by 10 meter cube of concrete. And they have a giant crane that can drop that cube anywhere in the factory. Now, for you Americans, that's a first down. So a first down wide, a first down deep, and a first down tall. 10 meters or 10 yards if you're, you're still stuck in the old system. But let's say they can take that giant cube and drop it anywhere. Now, obviously, if they drop it at the entrance, the factory's gonna have to shut down. If they drop it on the electrical service, the factory's gonna have to shut down. But there's a number of places anywhere on the grounds where that block will be almost irrelevant. Maybe it's just in the corner or in the middle and the, the trucks can just drive around it. Or even if they dropped it on the giant gantry, the thing must be, I don't know, a kilometer long? Maybe not quite, maybe half a kilometer long. I don't know, there's a giant gantry that runs down the entire property with a crane that can pick up giant heavy things. Well, if you dropped it in the middle of that gantry, you might break it. But if you dropped it on the ends, you still have the other end to work with. So functionality depends upon position. It depends upon usage. It depends upon how often a particular place is used. In fact, just across the street, they have another yard. It's empty. It's, there's piles of broken concrete, piles of sand, piles of dirt, gigantic mud holes. It's where they put all the parts that didn't come out right. They throw it over there and they break them up. And I don't know what they do with them after that, but it's, a, it's just a junkyard. How functional is that junkyard? Probably a lot less functional than the factory. There's probably less places you could break here and more places you could break or get in the way with over there. So functionality depends very much on usage. So let's now talk about the genome. How much of it is functional? Now, if you raise this question online, you're gonna get hit with a whole bunch of spammy comments from people who think they know what they're talking about, saying, oh, the genome is just junk. You creationists don't know what you're talking about. It's 98% junk, 2% of it's functional. Wait a minute, that's an old number. Yeah, 2% of it codes for protein. But if you listened or watched my last episode, you'll know that there are a lot of other functional classes of DNA in the non-protein coding regions. So it's more than 2%. How much of it is an open question? Now I have an article that I posted on creation.com. It's titled, What Proportion of the Human Genome is Actually Functional? I would refer you to that for a lot more details. There's a lot of really interesting things in that article. I'm basing this off the work of a new paper called A Genomic Mutation Constraint Map Using Variation in 76,156 Human Genomes by Chen et al. It is an amazing paper. First of all, because it has 200 co-authors. That's a massive, massive effort. Uh, these people, they call themselves the Genome Aggregation Database Consortium. Over 200 researchers from multiple institutions spending millions of dollars trying to assess the functionality of the genome. And the way they did it was by looking at which parts of the genome are constrained. That is, when you look at 76,000 people, what parts don't vary from one person to another? If they don't vary, the assumption is they can't mutate. If they can't mutate, the assumption is they're highly functional. It's a very interesting study. It's fascinating. The things that they learned are genius. In fact, one of the clear things that they showed with the protein coding regions are more constrained than the non-protein coding regions. In other words, there's less variability from person to person in our genes that code for proteins than in the non-coding DNA areas. That doesn't mean those places are non-functional, but they're definitely less constrained. Just like in this factory, you can take this gigantic block of concrete and drop it in different places. It doesn't mean if a place you land in it if the factory can still function, it doesn't mean that spot is not functional. It just means there's an alternate that the factory has to use, a different way around it, or maybe you didn't kill off a critical component. You might affect the output of the factory, maybe you know one bridge span per year. 
it wouldn't sound like a big difference if they're making thousands of bridge bands per year, but it still might be negative, just not highly negative. Now, classically, there are three different ways that scientists use to try to assess functionality in the genome. One of the ways, I'm just going to call it the phylogenetic method. They would look for shared sections of DNA between very different species, so humans and chimpanzees, humans and fish, humans and jellyfish. You know, what parts of these genomes are constrained, are, are very similar from one dissimilar species to the next? And the assumption was, well, if these pieces of the genome have stayed the same over so many millions of years, they must be highly functional. And we'll get back to that thought in a second because this Chen et al. paper destroyed that whole argument. But hold that thought. The first method is the phylogenetic method. The second classical method, um, let's call it uh, the Genome-Wide Association Survey, GWAS. Usually looking for a disease or a trait like you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, or sickle cell anemia, or they would find a trait that's shared by a bunch of people and then say, okay, what parts of their genome do they have in common? So in GWAS, they do statistical analyses to try to link traits or phenotypes to genes, or to DNA, to specific letters in the DNA. It's a giant statistical effort and they're notoriously difficult to pin down. There's a lot of genes that like, like skin color or hair color or eye color. There are a lot of different genes that affect those traits. Some of them more than others. So you might have one particular gene that might explain 50% of the skin color variation. Another gene might explain 10%. Another gene might explain 5%. And the rest, we don't know what is explained by. It's a gene somehow, but we're not sure which ones. Because so many different things can interfere and interact and combine together to give you the final individual. So talking about this factory here. What are the different instructions from the foreman to the workers to get this factory to work? And probably different workers can do the same thing, or one is maybe specified to do one thing in particular, but he can always probably do something else if there's a slack day or something. So information in this factory is not codified precisely. And a lot of the information in the genome is also not codified precisely. So we have three methods. The phylogenetic method, looking at dissimilar species, seeing what they share. Then genome-wide association surveys to try to statistically pin down specific traits to specific phenotypes. And then we have the method we, we need to talk about here, the constraint map. What areas of the genome cannot mutate? Those should be the highly functional ones. And yet, it's not really that simple because we know that amongst A, C, G, and T, C mutates a lot more often than A or G or T. It's the most mutable letter in the genome. So you can't just say, well, here's a stretch of DNA and here's how much mutation I expect. No, you have to say, how many C's are in there? Oh, okay, well, if that many C's, then I would expect this mutation rate. But at this many G's, I would expect that mutation rate. But it's not only that, because you have to separate the coding areas from the non-coding areas. And some of the non-coding areas are tightly constrained, and some areas of the genome in general just are more, more mutable than other areas. So what you need is a very sophisticated mutation model. In other words, the scientists have to add a lot of art to the process. That makes science fun when you have, you know, human decision-making influencing the outcome. As long as everyone acknowledges it, it's perfectly fair, but you have to, at the end, say, okay, we are limited by our ability to estimate what mutations we expect. And that's what they did. They built a very sophisticated mutation map of the genome. Then they took the genome, they broke it down in 100 base pair bins non-overlapping bins, 100 letters, next 100 letters, next 100 letters, next 100 letters, over all 3.1 billion base pairs. Well, that's not quite true. They don't have, they're not using a fully sequenced genomes, but they're using mostly sequenced genomes. So there's still some areas what they can't talk about because they didn't sequence those areas. But they're looking at most of the genome in 100 base pair groups. And they said, okay, how much variation is in that? How much variation do we expect to find in that? And does the expectation meet reality. And when they find places that differ from reality, they say, oh, look at that. This place has a lot less mutations than we would predict based on our model. Therefore, it must be tightly constrained. Works for me, that's really interesting. But the first thing they discover was that their constraint map conflicts with the phylogenetic map. That is, 
all these hundreds of studies done comparing distant related species searching for similar pieces of DNA and then the assumption that evolution has kept them the same after all these millions of years, they actually don't work because those sections that we share, the human share between other species, are mutable within species, within us, within humans. We see a lot of variation in the phylogenetically conserved regions. So what does that mean? It means that either evolution isn't true or something very different is happening in the genome. It might mean that when God made these genomes, he simply put similar sequences in distant related genomes that have no evolutionary connection at all. Or it might mean the evolutionists have to go back to square one and rethink all their analyses because literally hundreds if not thousands of papers might be disqualified based on these findings. Now we wouldn't have known that because no one ever sequenced, you know, 1,000 carp genomes or 1,000 butterfly genomes. But now we have 76,000 human genomes. We can make that comparison within humans. And it directly questions lots and lots and lots of evolutionary speculations. I think that's amazing and fascinating. They also discovered that, un unsurprisingly, the protein coding regions are more constrained than the non-protein coding regions. That is true. But they definitely found non-protein coding regions that were constrained, things that can't mutate. That's, not also, that's also not a surprise. We should predict that. But what about the rest? What about sections of the genome that produce RNA, but the RNA is never made into protein, or that RNA is not involved in uh, the regulation of a protein coding gene itself? What do we do with those sections? Well, over the last couple of decades, we've discovered a lot of functions for RNA that has nothing to do with coding for protein. In fact, RNA interference is a widespread phenomenon in all cells. RNA, when it's made, even if it doesn't make a protein, if that piece of RNA is similar to a protein coding gene, it can stick to that DNA and interfere with transcription. So you can't make the protein if this so-called pseudogene has made a messenger RNA and sticks to the DNA. We can also have RNA interference because RNA sticks to similar RNAs. So if you have two RNAs floating in solution, they can stick to each other. And so you can have RNA from a non-protein coding area interfering with the RNA of a protein coding gene. But when you talk about RNAs that stick together, they don't have to be perfectly exact. They, they, not at all. As long as enough letters are similar, they can stick together. I explained that in my last episode also. So RNA interference is very critically important in the cell. And a lot of the non-protein coding regions are designed to do RNA interference or they're designed to stick to DNA upstream of a gene and turn it off. Well, you don't have to have an exact match usually. You can have a couple of mismatches. So the non-protein coding regions are less constrained, but it doesn't mean they're not functional. And so this 200 plus person paper with all these millions of research dollars spent, all they could show us was what's the most tightly constrained regions of the genome, not how the genome is functional. Just like if you took this factory and you tried to figure out which part is most functional, it doesn't mean the less functional parts are non-functional. It doesn't mean that the junkyard across the street doesn't serve a function because it has a very important function in getting rid of all the detritus out of the functional area and shoving it off to the side so they can deal with it later. It's funny because the cell does the same thing. The body does the same thing. Our waste products are pushed off into vesicles or, or bags or intestines to get rid of later at whenever it happens. It has to happen eventually, but the timing is not always critically important. So in the end, how much of the genome is functional? You know, honestly, I don't know how to answer the question. I know that it's a lot more functional than just 2%. That's the, an old, outdated idea. JBS Haldane, 1950s, did some mathematical work, and he says, hey, uh, we can't select for a lot of mutations. 1970s, they come up with junk DNA theory, say, oh, only 2% of the genome codes for protein, the rest of it is just neutral, it can mutate at will. Now we have the Human Genome Project, we have the ENCODE Project, we have the, the 100,000 Genomes Project, the 1,000 Genomes Project, the All of Me Project. We have all these massive genome sequencing things, and we know that a lot more of the genome is necessary than 2%. We know that a lot more of the genome is functional than just 2%. It's just, after that, it's just a question of, yeah, but how important is it? Because there are places you can delete. Yep, you can delete it and you'll still live. It doesn't mean it's not functional. It just means it's not critically important. So all I know 
is that if the functional parts of the genome grow to be larger than the evolutionary model can handle, and that's only a few percent, then they're the ones with a problem, a huge problem. And we've already gotten to the point where there's more functionality in the genome than they generally want to admit, as I explained in my last episode also. And we know that there's more parts of the genome that are functional than they're going to be able to explain in six and a half million years since their common ancestors with chimpanzees. And now we know that the similar phylogenetic pieces in different species can mutate. That means that that's not a good estimate of evolutionary heritage. So Mr. Evolutionist, that's your problem, not mine. I'm just a reporter and I'm happy to report this here on Biblical Genetics. Hey everybody, thank you so much for your support. If you want to contribute to Biblical Genetics, there'll be some links in the show notes.